Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akish Rafi. Today is March 18, 2021, and I'm speaking with Warwick Anderson, who's at the University of Sydney in Australia. Warwick works on the history of science, medicine, and public health in the Pacific, Australia, Southeast Asia, and the U.S. Thank you for joining us, Warwick. It's a pleasure, Babak. I've been listening to your other podcast with great interest. Thanks for uh, having me on board. Uh, I'd like to start, if I may, with an acknowledgement that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I want to pay respect to elders past and present. Thank you, Warwick. In your work, you've argued that studying race in the global south can open up new ways of understanding the history of race and race science in the 20th century. Can you tell us what race and race science look like in the global south and how that was different from race science in Europe and North America? Well, when I started writing about race science, uh, which was back in the last century, I wanted to do three things. The first was to uh, explain uh, the contribution of medicine, the biomedical sciences particularly, especially colonial and tropical medicine, to the shaping of racial thought and practice. It now seems extraordinary, but most people writing about race science were confining themselves to the North Atlantic, really, uh, physical anthropology, human biology. Uh, And most people writing about tropical medicine uh, were talking about the techniques of disease control and scarcely ever mentioned race. So that was one thing I wanted to do. The other thing I wanted to do was critically study the fabrication of whiteness. So much of the history of racial thought and practice up until the uh, 1990s, and even now, I suppose, uh, was focused on the invention of categories of non-white others. And whiteness itself was a sort of unmarked category. It was implicit, though, I thought, in most biomedical science. I wanted to, in a sense, expose that. The third thing, which is more pertinent to your question, is actually I wanted to situate race science beyond the North Atlantic littoral, beyond Western Europe and North America. So much of the historiography had focused on that region, which uh, was taken to be, in a sense, universal, global, planetary, uh, when I thought it was actually quite peculiar and provincial in its own way. The rest of the world, where most people live, was assumed by most historians and others, I think, uh, from that region to be a sort of data mine or a place where science happened to diffuse to and spread out and maybe was slightly adapted and perhaps done worse. Uh, And so there was this sort of, at best, ignorance, really, of what the rest of the world had been doing. For that reason, I wrote a book called Cultivation of Whiteness in the 1990s, I wrote it. What I wanted to do in the book was confer some sort of intellectual agency on white settlers in Australia. So looking at how racial thought was generated in Australia from the late 18th century, really. But I wanted to see this as not just a sort of derivative intellectual formation, which is the way people might have written about it previously, but I wanted to look at how local conditions in terms of labour, economy, indigenous opposition had shaped race science in this particular site. Now, it was generally very well reviewed, but there was a review in ISIS that rankled because uh, while it was generally a favourable review, uh, the reviewer took me to task for not engaging with real race science, which presumably was the race science of North America and Western Europe. But that was the whole point of the book, was to say that this was not hegemonic. From that, I realised that one could start to think about South-South intellectual connections concerning the perception and the shaping of ideas of human difference, rather than looking at a sort of diffusion from the North Atlantic. And so I developed a project called Race and Ethnicity in the Global South. What I wanted to do with a group of brilliant postdoctoral fellows was to look at these South-South connections in terms of uh, how uh, race was fabricated. Now, that 
dwindled a little to looking at Pacific connections, and uh, in particular, uh, Latin America and the Asia Pacific and how they were linked in various ways intellectually. Uh, there's still a lot to be done, I think, on the Indian Ocean and the circuits of uh, thought about race and science of race in the Indian Ocean. So um, that resulted in numerous publications, including recently a special issue of historical studies in the natural sciences on how peoples of the Pacific and Australasia became genetic and therefore human in a certain way uh, through scientific research. And also there was an earlier special issue edited with Susan Lindy, and there's another special issue of Journal of Southeast Asian Studies co-edited with uh, Ricardo Rock, which was on uh, comparative racializations in island Southeast Asia, and a book that I co-edited again with Ricardo Rock and also with Ricardo Ventura Santos on lusotropicalism across the Portuguese empire. So again, focusing on South-South connections in terms of analysing and critiquing racial thought and practice. And the hypothesis was really that in the Southern Hemisphere or the Global South, there seems to have been, partly because of the nature of settler colonialism and imperialism more generally, a greater emphasis in race science on notions of human plasticity, environmental adaptation, slightly more positive appreciation of the blurring of racial boundaries, and also a very interesting uh, emphasis on biological absorption, especially of indigenous peoples, and racial amalgamation, the formation of new races. Now, all of these things are regarded as conventionally as Latin race formations or South American ones, but you could find them even in supposedly Anglo settler societies such as uh, Australia and New Zealand, and to an extent in uh, Southern Africa before the 1930s, anyhow. Now, I don't want to be too uh, rigid about this because, of course, you can also find instances uh, of the same practices and theories in, um, in North America. And then you do have places like Queensland in Australia and then South Africa after the 1930s, which became quite uh, segregationist and in that sense uh, exceptional. While there's a gradation of thought and practice and race science, obviously, around the globe, uh, there does seem to be a distinction that one can make between uh, this greater emphasis on human plasticity in the global south and environmental adaptation, uh, mixing, absorption, and so on, and the conventional Western European, North American emphasis on much more structured racial typologies or even rigid racial typologies and aversion to race mixing and emphasis on segregation, hardline eugenics, and so on. Um, at least that was the argument I wanted to uh, investigate with this project. And the idea really uh, was actually rather than treat the racial thought and practice that emerged from the North Atlantic literal as universal or even conventional, I wanted to show how exceptional it was. It was actually unusual and uh, deplorable. And in fact, the so-called decline in race science after uh, World War II, one could say, as Sebastián Guillaño has, uh, that could actually be re regarded as a substitution of these more flexible Southern understandings of race for the more rigid racial typologies of Western Europe and, uh, and North America, not uh, actually moving away from racial thought at all, but just actually a different style of racial thought. I have to say, I don't want to sound as though I'm trying to exonerate the global South, far from it, uh, and especially not my own country. It's still exceptionally racist, but it's a different form of racism, actually. White privilege is behind this racism. Uh, in the South, just as it is in, uh, uh, in the global North. But it's a different style of racism. And, you know, if one's to combat racism, one has to understand the racism of one's own setting and not assume it's the racism of somewhere else, such as North America. I mean, I think it's uh, important that we situate the racial sciences in order to, in a sense, target them and uh, try to dismantle them anyhow. That's very interesting. To situate it, you mentioned the environment a few times. Can you tell us what was the relationship between understandings of climate and race for, say, British settlers? 
Yes. Well, this is another transition that I wrote about in uh, Cultivation of Whiteness, my first book. And uh, of course, for most of the 19th century, there was a theory that races uh, were adapted to particular environmental settings. Uh, there were races in proper places, if you like. Uh, and whether this was through evolution or through providence, it was a firmly held um, assumption that uh, once you moved from that proper place of your race, you would be subject to uh, degeneration, sickness, uh, death even. And so there was this fear in uh, colonial societies, in particular settler colonial societies, that by moving out of Europe, Europeans would actually uh, degenerate. Go tropo in the tropics is one way of putting it, but but they, they would basically either die out as a white race or they would become coloured. So there was an enormous scientific effort that went into showing how robust and durable whiteness really was and separating it from its environment. And this went on from the, the 1880s through the uh, uh, turn of the century and into the 20th century. And it was happening in places like Northern Australia, which is tropical. And Americans were doing this in Manila, looking at uh, white troops in uh, colonial Philippines as well. I wrote about that in Colonial Pathologies. There were a series of physiological investigations into the whiteness of European settlers in tropical Australia and the white North Americans sojourners in the Philippines, a series of investigations which were supposed to show that whites could survive any conditions. And this was rationalised by saying, well, the causes of disease are not deemed to be uh, environmental any longer, it's not miasma, it's not disease arising from an environment. Uh, and they were replaced with these germ theories. Germ theories, as I've written about extensively, were racialized in colonial settings, settler colonial settings, certainly, such as the in the US, as well as Australia. Uh, and so what happens is that fears of disease, of uh, pathogenicity, pass from the environment to other races, in effect. And so that helps uh, exonerate the environment and say that whites can occupy any land they want and live in any climate they want to take possession of. And that was supplemented by a greater confidence that changes in dress, diet, uh, the invention of the electric fan in around 1900, all these sort of things were going to uh, uh, make it possible for whites to possess uh, what were previously regarded as inimical environments. And so this is most vividly illustrated, I think, in northern Australia, where from the 1860s or so, Pacific labourers were brought in, indentured, uh, a form of slavery, to work in the cane field, to labour in the tropics, because whites were deemed to be uh, too vulnerable to the, that climate. But by 19, 1900, with the formation of the new nation predicated on its whiteness. The White Australia policy was the first legislation passed by the new federal parliament in uh, 1901. Scientists set to work in the north and in the Australian Institute of Tropical Medicine in Townsville to prove that whites can labour in the tropics. And indeed, the only threat to whites in the tropics, according to the scientists uh, in Townsville, was from contact with other races. So white Australia goes from being a, a physiological impossibility to being a microbiological necessity. And so it's interesting to see the flexibility of what was really essentially race science in this period. So anyhow, I, I could go on because I've, I've become interested recently in what happens to this notion of racial acclimatisation. I mean, what is needed to protect whites from an uncomfortable environment. And so I've been looking uh, in the last year or two at uh, how racial acclimatization research becomes generic research into human comfort in the tropics after World War II, mostly sponsored through the US military, actually. And so the same people who were trying to prove in Australia and the US that whites could happily thrive and labour in the tropics uh, end up leading this research into generic human comfort after World War II. Uh, and so these notions of comfort 
and care of the body in the tropics were really about white comfort and care for whites in the tropics. But their whiteness in this research has been erased and forgotten. So uh, I think it's an interesting line of inquiry. When the folks that you study use terms like white or British or otherwise Anglo-Saxon, what was the difference? When or where were these terms used? And why would the differences between these terms matter for the history of race and race science? As so often, I actually go back to W.E.B. Du Bois uh, in a fascinating essay. In, I think he wrote it around 1910, uh, The Souls of White Folks. Uh, he actually talks about how across the globe, and of course he was also uh, aware of the global colour line. He was very insistent that we have to understand the global colour line. Uh, but uh, he said right across the globe, people are discovering their whiteness and what a wonderful thing it seems to be for them. It struck me that this is actually what, what tends to happen, I think, across the globe in the 1890s, 1900s, that Europeans discover their whiteness in a way. Going back to the book Cultivation of Whiteness, I talk about how uh, until the late 19th century, most white settlers in Australia would regard themselves as British. I mean, towards the end of that period, they started to talk about being Anglo-Saxon, a few of the elite did, as they did in the east coast of the US in various uh, fancy salon. Uh, but in southern Australia, people were talking about being British or Scottish or Irish or German even and so on. But then it was actually during the gold rushes, but really gaining momentum towards the end of the century as the Europeans moved into the Australian tropics. And there were increasing concerns about Asian migration and indeed even perhaps invasion, as the term was, uh, from the north. People started to imagine themselves as being white, as W.E.B. Du Bois said so long ago. And so I started to think about this in terms of uh, Susan Lee Starr. Lee Starr and uh, Griesema came up with this notion of boundary objects, uh, classic in science and technology studies, where boundary objects are sort of plastic enough to adapt to local conditions, uh, but not robust enough to retain a common identity across sites. I think that's the way they'd put it. So they're, they're, they're weakly structured across sites, but strongly structured at individual sites. And then I thought, well, I think in some ways, whiteness as it emerges or becomes a popular identity and characterization in the late 19th century is in a sense a boundary subject, where it's actually emerging on boundaries, racial boundaries, environmental boundaries. When Europeans feel under stress, anxious, uh, threatened, whether by other people or by a harsh environment as in Australia, or in the deserts or up north in the tropics, they become white. And just as in the Philippines, Americans of European origin always talked about themselves as being white. Yet back in America, they would talk about themselves as being Anglo-Saxon or whatever. And so it seems to me that whiteness is a sort of boundary subject. And that's why, in a sense, it's unmarked in certain places. So when a white person feels secure, they become more expressive. They become British, German, American, British American, Anglo-American, Anglo-Saxon even. And, you know, this is, this is something that uh, James Baldwin, it's always worth uh, referring back to James Baldwin. James Baldwin said this decades ago, well, yes, well into the last century, where he said that there is no white community. There's no white community. He was referring to German Americans, British, uh, English Americans, Scottish Americans, and so on. They were the communities. But whiteness, Bill Baldwin says, whiteness emerges when Europeans need to subjugate land and peoples. And I think that, that I think, is actually a very telling insight. Could you say more about that? In your work, you've referenced James Baldwin and Homi Baba in calling whiteness a strategy of authority rather than an essential identity. So could you say more about what that means and how that might help elucidate current thinking about race and race science? I don't want to make any generalizations here because I've 
already been talking about the need to situate race science. So it would really depend on the location and uh, what was going on in that particular setting. But certainly, I mean, I was struck by uh, Homi Barber's argument that whiteness is a strategy of authority, which is clearly derived from what Baldwin had been saying. And I think it's actually a very um, flexible strategy of authority. I mean, it is actually quite, it's almost modular in a way, because it, it lacks that expressiveness of real community identity. It's a means of subjugating, which works quite effectively. It's a, a strategy. But I think that what that would suggest is that in different sites where you find people who feel under stress, people of European origin sometimes, uh, not necessarily of European origin even. Whiteness is very flexible in that way. People are strategically deploying whiteness. In that sense, it's actually a boundary marker. This is, it seems, in many countries, happening more and more often uh, with the rise of various forms of white nationalism. And as I say, each one is specific to its own site, but there is perhaps a family resemblance in that typically the white man is an aggressive figure emerging out of a sense of stress and anxiety. And the white man is a figure that's actually predicated on violence. It's that's what it's about. It is about violence and suppression and subjugation. And that's what whiteness has always been about. It's not so much an expressive identity as a strategy of authority, as Homi Baba put it. I think, actually, just to say a bit more, I think there are very few studies of whiteness uh, in the history of science in North America, the history of medicine. And that's always puzzled me. I mean, there's still, I keep waiting for someone to write a book like Cultivation of Whiteness for North America. I'm sure it could be done. I remember when I presented some of this uh, work on uh, the cultivation of whiteness in Australia uh, and whiteness as a sort of uh, strategy of authority in Australia and how it was bolstered and, and supplemented through scientific research. When I presented this at Berkeley around 2001, a very senior cultural historian there said, oh, well, there's nothing like that in America. We never had a positive science of whiteness in North America. I said, well, actually, it may be unmarked, but it's there. I mean, it, it, most of the uh, science that was done, certainly uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century in North America, was about whiteness. Uh, but there's been a, a peculiar reluctance of North American scholars uh, to uh, interrogate these uh, hidden assumptions of whiteness. Uh, and I find this rather uh, disappointing, certainly closely related to the failure of most North American scholars to understand that they are a settler colonial society and not a neo-Europe. Um, I'm still waiting for people to do this. I, I, I suspect there's a sort of trained incapacity among white Americans to step back and see this, trained from grade school to grad school, I suspect. Um, so uh, I imagine that uh, there is going to be a critical study of the whiteness of North American science and medicine. It won't come from a white graduate student or scholar. Well, maybe this discussion will provoke or inspire someone. I hope so. It's about time. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you, Warwick, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. You can find links to Warwick's publications, more resources for exploring this topic, other podcasts, video forums, archival spotlights, as well as opportunities to connect with our community of scholars at chstm.org. This podcast is made possible with the generous support of the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Rita Allen Foundation.